Hello, it's Friday, it's nine o'clock. I'm Tina Dehealy. Welcome to the programme. Why current and former members of the Mormon Church are calling for an end to the practice of asking children as young as eight intimate and sexual questions during annual interviews by church officials. Now next, a story which might include sexual references and descriptions. So if you've got a child with you, you might want to take them away from the telly for the next 10 minutes or so. We're talking about a well-known branch of Christianity with millions of worshippers worldwide. But a petition against practices within the Mormon Church is growing in the US and is gathering momentum here in the UK too. It's about concerns that children as young as 12 often undergo what's known as a worthiness interview in which they are sometimes asked sexually explicit questions. The point of the interviews is to prepare Mormon youth spiritually and ensure they are obeying the commandments, one of which is the law of chastity. But we've heard that the church leaders are asking questions uh, which some say are intrusive, embarrassing and potentially damaging. Only men carry out the interviews. A petition calling to ban the worthiness interviews was started in the United States. It's had more than 20,000 signatures from within the Mormon community, several hundred of which are thought to be from here in the UK, where we understand the practice happens too. Well, we are joined now in the studio by David Shepherd. He's left the church, but has experienced intrusive interviews, which he says left him with uh, feelings of guilt. Uh, Peter Bleakley, he's a current member of the church who knows people who've undergone worthiness interviews and Stephen Blomfield is also an active member of uh, the Mormon Church and he has three children. Uh, good morning, thank you good for morning, joining us. David, if I can come to you first of all, what's your experience of worthiness interviews? Uh, <clears throat> so the first um, interview I probably would have had would have been around 12 years old um, and it's a very normal part of the, the, the culture, you sort of, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a one-on-one one -on -one interview with the bishop Initially, it's normally about just things, how, how are you doing, how are things going, um, but to ensure that the, uh, the youth and, and myself uh, are going in the right direction, we're also probed about uh, questions of a, uh, of a sexual nature, um, sort of initially asking things about uh, masturbation, which at that age I didn't even really know what that was, so in a way it was almost introducing me to the topic. Um, pornography as well. Didn't know what that was, but uh, I soon realised. When you were being interviewed, what was going through your mind? How did you feel at the time when you were being asked these questions about things, as you say, you had no idea about? Um, at the age of 12. Okay, so it, it, it would have been a strange mix of, of normal, because it's just, it's what I... It's what's in the culture. It's what you do. There's there's a lot of rites of passage within the Mormon Church, and at 12 years old, you know, the men receive the priesthood, and then you start having interviews. So that side of it was normal. Um, but the yeah the it, it would it, it would become increasingly uncomfortable when I realised that uh, you know things such as masturbation, which wasn't an issue before I knew what it was within the context of the church, which was that it was a bad thing, whereas initially it was sort of, oh, okay, it's, it's something that the body does. Um, and so when realizing that and realizing it within the context of, you know, you can read in, in the scriptures where it sort of equates um, breaking the law of chastity in, in one stage lower than, than murder. So in my mind, uh, Doing that's, that's a lot to put on a 12 year old, isn't it? When you yeah. are going through puberty and all of a sudden, I'm assuming there are feelings of, of shame. And if it's one step down from murder, as a, as a 12 year old, that must be very difficult. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, and it's very isolating because I, I didn't, I, I felt like I was the only one with, with those, those kinds of issues, it's not, it wasn't until later in life where I started talking to people and realised I wasn't the only one. But even then, you know, I, you know, for the my entire my entire teenage years would have been sort of layered and coated in in mm. the shame of, you know, trying not to do things that are very that are very normal, you know, and are very mm. help very healthy in a number of ways. Peter, you're nodding. Um, yeah. Does that sound familiar to you? Absolutely, I experienced the same, and, I, and this is for young men and young women in the church. Um, it becomes an ever-present thing in your life. And our church is, um, we have a lay unpaid ministry, we're amateurs, 
everyone participates. We, we will give a, a role or a calling to anyone who can move and is willing to do it. Right. So the, the roles of the people who ask these questions, who have that responsibility, will, they'll serve in that role for a few years and some other people will come in and do it. So in a way, we all take turns sort of judging and supporting and, and sometimes, you know, asking these questions of each other. Um, and it's not the entire thing. Well, I love my community. I love my church. Fantastic, wonderful, good-hearted people. But we've inherited a system where this has been normalised. And now that we're entering the 21st century um, and we're much more aware now of safeguarding issues, it's become untenable, really. Um, I'm a teacher and I sort of had a really interesting conversation in my congregation recently with other adults and we were discussing safeguarding issues uh, because it is starting to, to become a concern more widely. And we just sort of shared, you know, I'm a teacher, we had a person there who worked for the ambulance service, we have a member of our congregation who runs the sexual health services for the youth in our area, we have a member of our diocese who runs a fostering agency and we're all, we get state-of-the-art safeguarding training in our professional lives. Mm. And it then just seems crazy that we, in our church community, which we run together, which we are responsible for, um, because we all share ministry, um, we don't apply the same standards or it just doesn't happen. Mm. And my, my uh, diocese is actually being very proactive. We recently got an international expert who is a member of the church in safeguarding to begin a process of training and there are individual cases of fantastic best practice going on. But ultimately our church is very top down. The leadership internationally determine the guidelines mm. and the policies. And those are very vaguely worded. And they're just not good enough, um, particularly in this day and age. They're not specifically enough to protect children. They've recently said that young people can request someone else in the room in these interviews. But the pressure is on that young person to ask for that not that it's standard and should always happen every time. So we're in a situation where our church's current practices and procedures wouldn't survive two minutes of scrutiny in our workplace. Mm. And yet here we are as adults doing this. But surely yeah. there's a, you know, if you're talking about eight year olds, 12 year olds, there's a parental mm. responsibility here as well, mm. Stephen. I grew up in the church and um, now I have three children nine, seven, and five. The church has a hierarchy which is directed from the United States and that's the teachings are correlated and taught in congregations worldwide. And all those uh, are the same teachings. And there's some fantastic teachings that the church offers. Um, if you believe in God and Jesus Christ, that's what they're promoting. But they're also promoting standards and um, they're encouraging members to contribute positively to their community and they're encouraging members to live their standards as uprightly and with integrity and morality as much as possible. Um, with that though, they become, those standards become prescribed and they get taught to children and at eight years old, that age that we've been talking about, that's when they can officially be baptised and become a member of the church um, in a formal sense. And so there is an interview that they go through with the bishop, um, who's the leader of their local congregation. And then as they go through the youth program in the church, which is fantastic, it encourages the individuals to better themselves, mm. to, um, to be a better person and to help others and care about others. But they're also taught all these standards, which could be seen as for their safeguarding. For example, I want my daughter to be looked after and if she does have a boyfriend in her teenage years, I want that boy to be respectful to her, yeah. but it means that she is also aware, acutely aware of all the things that she might do while experiencing life that might so go against you, some of those teachings. How do you teachings. reconcile your faith and that with your children? Because w would you allow them to be interviewed? This is the issue that I have. Yes you or see, no, as first, the, and then explain. Would you allow them to be interviewed? At the moment, no. Right, why? I'm not comfortable with it. Because the local leader, the bishop, or even higher up than that, we have um, a, a group, a, a cluster of congregations would have a stake president. These individuals can interview. Um, and like Peter said, 
they haven't been trained, but they're there to mentor um, these youth and try to encourage them to do better, but at the same time, all of them are individuals. And so they might ask questions which, which might be intrusive. And it varies depending on who the leader is. Mm -hmm. So when I found out about the petition, it resonated with me because I'm uncomfortable that my children would be asked questions that, although it m might be, have good intentions mm -hmm. to try to encourage them to be better, sometimes they would be inappropriate mm -hmm. and intrusive. And it's not something I think an individual, whether it's an ecclesiastical leader or not, whether it's in my faith or any other faith, mm. I don't think they should be asking children these types of questions. Yeah, I mean, and there's obviously some people watching may have strong opinions about the faith itself, mm. which they're entitled to do. Of and that discussion maybe isn't for today about how they view those relationships. It's more about that position of power mm. when it comes to vulnerable children and the fact that they have no training um, and these children, and it, they are very impressionable, and that will then impact, no doubt, their relationships for the rest of their lives. Typically, a leader, a bishop, might be bishop for five, six, seven years. This could span the whole time of somebody's teenage years. And if somebody felt like they were falling short from the standards set by the church, which are good, wholesome, respectable standards, I, I don't have issues with the standards. Well, the chastity thing being one down from murder, but... OK, so um, the importance that is placed on them yeah. might be severe, and it does concern people. So when individuals might fall short, this means that they might be going to their local leader who is representing th their God, Jesus Christ, and confessing their sins, and they're also at their most vulnerable. Mm. And it only takes one leader that is exercising his position inappropriately where, as, as I've read in the petition, mm. many people have had experiences which are horrifying. Yeah. Have you experienced guilt as a result of, of um, these in worthiness interviews? Yes. Just briefly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you don't even have to have the worthiness interview to experience the guilt yeah. because you know and through guilt living just, your just life. And guilt just for being sexually yeah. active. Well, if even something as simple as masturbation, which mm. you would say is a part of normal teenage mm. development, you know, it, I think in a sense our concern is the, the parameters of what is considered to be part of the law of chastity goes too far. We've, we do not have a culture of being very good at um, talking healthily about sexual matters. There are always a few individuals who, partly because of their professional experiences, may be brilliant at that. Um, but we do, you know, the, the Protect LDS Children movement and petition mm. is, is not about bringing the whole thing down. It's just about saying yeah. some of this is not right. We shouldn't have men one-to-one -one with children in a room. That's just standard it's now it, in But it's only men who carry out these yes. interviews, yeah. which yeah. is problematic in yeah. itself. And it's that 2018, brings in issues for many women. Can I yeah. ask you, mm. did you sign the petition? I have not Stephen. signed the petition. Just because I haven't gone on the website online. Oh, are you going to sign the petition? I'm in full support. And um, I've, Sam Young, the gentleman that spoke out, um, mm -hmm. I'm in full support of everything that he's done. And I probably will sign the petition, but I've also discussed it with other members of the church, okay. mm -hmm. other family members. Mm -hmm. Will you oh, sign it? Enthusiastically, I've signed it and donated to the cause, yeah. Okay. And 50,000 people have signed it. Just so as far. enthusiastic, David? Yeah. Well, I've probably signed it more than once. Okay. <laughs> right. I'm sure. going to, and again, this is a very focused discussion. This isn't yeah. about the Mormon faith. This is yeah, about yeah. a particular yeah. e yeah. element in exactly. these worthiness interviews, I want mm. to add. And mm. this email's come in from Simon Fagg, who says, in faith communities, the process of uh, repentance, including confession, when someone has sinned, mm. is a long standing and helpful process mm. in drawing closer to God. It uh, in, is, in my experience, over the many years that when youth confess voluntarily they are very relieved and much happier. I am a lifelong member of the church and as a youth I found these meetings with my bishop inspiring and helpful. You have focused on conversations about sex I assume because it makes a good headline but the majority of the conversation is checking how the young person is doing in all aspects of their life. These meetings supplemented the support and guidance I received from my parents as a father of seven children. I also have appreciated the love and support that's been offered by these leaders to me, my children and to our family, including interviews about 
worthiness. So the final word uh, goes to Simon. Uh, well, in fact, no, the final word uh, goes to the Europe uh, area of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who sent us this statement. We share a common concern for the safety and well-being of youth. We condemn any inappropriate behaviour regardless of where or when it occurs. Local church leaders are provided with instructions regarding youth interviews and are expected to review and follow them. A caring, responsible spiritual leader plays a significant role in the development of a young person by reinforcing the teaching of parents and offering spiritual guidance. We express gratitude for the thousands of volunteer church leaders, men and women, who selflessly serve and mentor youth, individuals and families throughout the world. As with any practice in the church, we continually look for ways to improve and adjust by following the Saviour Jesus Christ and meeting the needs of our members.